You are about to be entertained by some of the biggest names in show business. For the next hour and 30 minutes, this program will present in person such bright stars as... Uh, Fred Allen, Robert Cummings. Lorraine Day. Jimmy Durante. Leo DeRocher. Portland Hoffa. Judy Holliday. Frankie Lane. Jane Pickens. Meredith Wilson. And my name, darlings, is Tallulah Bankhead. <laughs> The National Broadcasting Company presents The Big Show. So listen, America, the curtains of America. We're going to fill your parlor full of stars. The Big Show, 90 minutes with the most scintillating personalities in the entertainment world. Brought to you this Sunday and every Sunday at this same time as the Sunday feature of NBC's All-Star Festival. And here is your hostess, the glamorous, unpredictable Tallulah Bankhead. Well, darlings, we have just finished 13 weeks of the big show, and each show an hour and a half. Now, you won't believe this, I'm sure, but I just found out there are shows on radio that are only one half hour each. Well, I knew you wouldn't believe it, darling. <laughs> well, on this show, it takes a half an hour just to mention the names of the stars. <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, we thought we would save time by just referring to our stars by their initials, you know, like uh, Durante, Allen, and Holiday would be uh, a D-A-H. But we gave that up because on next week's show, we were thinking of having Cantor, Burl, and Sinatra. <laughs> I waited for you, darling. <laughs> so you can see why using initials is out. Out? What do you mean out? Now, here is safe by a mile. Leo de Rocha. <laughs> Okay, DeRosha, simmer down, simmer down. You're not managing the Johns now at the Polo Grounds. Well, I'm sorry, but you said out. Certain uh, b words in baseball, why, they upset me. I lose my head. Yeah, I know. A word like umpire, for instance. <laughs> I think it's perfectly awful the way you treat the umpires. Me? I don't bother the umps. Oh, not much you don't. Why is it the minute the umpires walk out before every game... You make everybody at the polo ground stand up and sing, oh, say, can you see? <laughs> well, you know me, Tallulah. Baseball's in my blood. Yeah, I thought you looked rather lumpy. <laughs> now, tell me, Leo, we giant fans have been waiting 14 long years now. How does the pennant look this year? Uh, looks the same. It's powder blue, and it kind of tapers off to a point. <laughs> And I, uh... uh... Leo, I know what it looks like, darling. I've seen plenty of pennants at Ebbets Field. <laughs> and I'm going to see one flying over the polo grounds this year. Am I? Gotcha, <laughs> baby! Well, Tallulah, just give me one more good long ball hitter, and we'll win that pennant quicker than you can say Jackie Robinson. We can use him, too. <laughs> No, but honestly, Leo, don't you think hoping to win a pennant this year is aiming uh, too high? Too high? Why, that ball was right over the... What do you mean, too high? Oh, darling, I'm so sorry. I used another word that upsets you. Down, boy. Easy now, easy. <laughs> Look, Tallulah, I'm not interested in talking baseball. This is my racket. That's what I'm interested in, acting. Ah, oh, acting you? Just a minute. Why the emphasis on you? This may surprise you, but I'm booked to star in my first play this summer, and it's going to be a hit. Oh, your first play is going to be a hit. Yes, and then I'm going into my third play. Now you're going from your first play to your third. Sure. With a hit, anybody can go from first to third. <laughs> so you're an actor. <laughs> Does Lorraine know about this? Lorraine who? Lorraine Day, your wife. Oh, that Lorraine Day. Yes, that Lorraine Day. You remember me? Oh, hello, honey. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
Lorraine, darling, what is this routine about Leo wanting to become an actor? Yes, I know. Leo B. Mayer, we call him around the house. <laughs> you know what he does, Tallulah? He won't let me go to many ball games. He makes me stay home and catch him on television so I can tell him how good his acting was when he went out on the field to argue with an umpire. I'd like to see Dr. Kildare do as well. Oh, tell me, Lorraine, do you get upset, darling, when you see Leo go out to argue with an umpire? Oh, no, not anymore. The minute I see him walk out, I start getting dinner. I, I know he'll be home early. <laughs> Baby, you must have early dinners quite often. <laughs> well, when the Giants play a doubleheader, we sometimes have dinner as early as two o'clock in the afternoon. Now, wait a minute, Lorraine. Don't go giving the impression that I fight with all the umpires. Well, no, not all of them. Much to my surprise, Tallulah, one night last week, Leo came home with an umpire after the game. We had him for dinner. Yeah, served on a platter with a baseball in his mouth. <laughs> Boy, was he tasty. Yes, that was the first umpire that ever agreed with Leo. But uh, <laughs> it must be very exciting being married to a man in baseball. Well, it, it's like being married to a man in any other business. I talk to the players' wives, and they tell me what kind of a day their husbands had at the polo grounds. Mm -hmm. Like Eddie Stanky's wife, she calls me very proudly and says, Eddie had a very good day today. He walked, he singled, he tripled, and he was hit on the head by a pitched ball. I wish the women would stay out of my baseball business. They always talk a good game. I'd like to see them out there playing it. If that's an offer, you can sign me now. You? Why the emphasis on you? <laughs> you wouldn't even know what to do. Now look, if you were on third base and we needed one run to win, it's the last of the night, there's one out, Lockman bunts, the pitcher comes in for the ball. Now how would you get home? Well, the same way I always get home, darling. I take a taxi. Ah, uh, pretty smart, darling. Well, this'll stop you. Suppose it's raining and you can't get a taxi. Well, this'll stop you, Buster. When it's raining, they don't play ball. <laughs> that ought to take care of him. Thanks, Tallulah. It's good to see somebody win an argument with Leo for a change. <laughs> well, I must say, Lorraine, that being the wife of a stormy baseball manager doesn't seem to have changed you very much you still have that fresh, lovely, scrubbed look. <laughs> Why shouldn't I look scrubbed? Every time we have an argument, Leo sends me to the showers. <laughs> Wait a minute, Mrs. DeRocher. Tallulah will start believing we do nothing but argue. Oh, no, I won't. You make a wonderful couple, darlings. Especially you, Lorraine. <laughs> I know, I know so well. You two will stick together through fair weather and foul. Foul? What do you mean, you knucklehead? That ball was fair by a mile. Oh, come on, Leo, before you get thrown out of the program. Come on, I'll make you a nice bowl of that breakfast of champions. Oh, I don't want that stuff again. I ate it all last year, and look where we finished. <laughs> Oh, hello, Portland Harbor. I'm on your program today, Miss Bankhead. Yes, I know. Well, I don't have anything to say for ten more pages. So what are you doing here now, darling? Well, I just thought I'd tell you I was here so you won't be surprised when I show up later. Well, I'll try not to be, darling. Thanks for the warning. People wandering in and out, no discipline And now, ladies and gentlemen We hear a bright, gay marching tune From a show which had a three-year run And is now back again on Broadway The song, the new Asmolean Marching Society And Students Conservatory Band And the show, of course, Where's Charlie? Now, Meredith Wilson, his big show, Oxford Chorus If you please Sunlight on the trumpets, here they come with the banners flying high. In my throat there's a lumpy sort of feeling, and a bright gleam of brightness in my eye. Here they come with the clarinets a wailing, here they come rather bravely up the square. And I know in a 
moment I'll be cheering And my fine Sunday hat will be high in the air For the new Ashmolean Marching Society of Students Conservatory Band Yes, the new Ashmolean Will have beat Napoleon With almost every instrument in hand There are those who favor The Philharmonic flavor But to me, the finest in the land Darling, that was just the pick-me-up I needed. Thanks for the lift. And here we come now to another lift. Two weeks ago, ladies and gentlemen, our program was graced by the presence of a brilliant young actress who entertained us with an excerpt from a Columbia picture, Born Yesterday, in which she starred with Broderick Crawford and William Holden. She was such a success on our show, we invited her back to do another scene from that hit picture. And here she is, Miss Judy Holliday in Born Yesterday. <laughs> Born Yesterday is the story of a wealthy junkman, Harry Brock, his dumb but beautiful girlfriend, Billy Dawn, and the young Washington newspaper man, Paul Vero, hired by Brock to give Billy an education. Well, our scene opens in the living room of Brock's expensive Washington hotel apartment. Billy is having her education furthered by more than conscientious Paul. You think I'm getting smarter, Paul? Certainly. Now, let's see. Who said this? The proper study of mankind is man. I don't know. You should. Why? I told you. I forgot. It was Pope. P the Pope? No, not the Pope. Alexander Pope. Ah. Uh, the proper study of... Mankind is man. Mankind is man. Because that means women, too. Yes. Yes, I know. <laughs> I've been studying different mankind lately, like the ones you told me, Thomas Jefferson last week and this week, Tom Paine. And all by myself, I got to thinking about Harry Brock. He works so hard to get what he wants, for instance. But he doesn't know what he wants. More of what he's got, probably. Money. Money. More people to push around. Money. It's not so bad as you think he is. I've been looking for you, too. Oh, hello, Harry. We were just talking about you. Yeah? Well, that ain't what I pay you for. Billy knows enough about me now. Too much, in fact. Well, go right ahead. Smarten her up. Excuse me while I take my shoes off. All right, Billy. What did you find out about Tom Paine? Oh, he was quite a fella. Where was he born? Do you remember? Yeah. London. Uh, uh, England. Someplace like that. What do you mean, London or England? It's the same thing. It is? London is in England. It's a city, London. England's a whole country. I forgot. Boy, oh boy, Phil, you've got some patience. Take it easy. How can anybody get so dumb? We all can't know everything, Harry. Uh, who's Tom Paine, for instance? 
What? You heard me, Tom Paine. What do I care who he is? I know. If you're so smart, who was Rabbit Moranville? Who? Rabbit Moranville. I didn't know any rabbits. <laughs> Rabbit Moranville, he's a, he's a baseball player. He used to play shortstop for the Braves, didn't he? What are you, some kind of a genius? No. I hire and fire geniuses every day. Who's Willie Hop? National billiard champion, and uh, it's pronounced Hoppy. That's what I said. Anyways, I didn't ask you, I asked her. All right, Billy, shall we go on with Tom Payne? Now, hold the phone. What's a peninsula? Ish. Don't give me that shh. <laughs> you think you know so much? What's a peninsula? It's a kind of a... Not you. It's that new medicine. <laughs> It's a body of land surrounded on three sides by water. So what's that to know? <laughs> so what's this, 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 this champagne to know? Some difference between Tom and a champagne. <laughs> Tom Payne practically started this whole country. You mean he's dead? Of course. Hey, fellow, what do you mean learning about dead people? <laughs> I just want to know how to act with live people. Education's pretty hard to control, Harry. One thing leads to... Work on her, will you, not me? No extra charge. I don't need nothing you can tell me. You know, the more I see you, I don't like you as much. But Jumbo's got no place, you're pretty fresh. You better watch out, I got an eye on you. All right, let's both watch out. If I want, I could knock your block off if I wanted. Yes, I know. All right, then. Just go ahead and do what you're supposed to, and that's all. We'll stop for now. No, 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 go ahead. I want to see how you do it. Not just now, if you don't mind. I've got to go lie down. You don't realize how hard I work. Ha ha, some joke. <laughs> 200 bucks a week and I can't even watch. You, London or England, why don't you give up? You know something? What? You're not such a big shot. I used to think so. <laughs> no more. All through history, there's been bigger men than you and better. Now, too. Name one. My father. Huh? <laughs> 25 a week. Now listen, cutie, don't get nervous just because you read a book. You're as dumb as you ever was. You think so, huh? Yeah, sure. But I don't mind. <laughs> you know why? Because you're the greatest... Oh, leave me alone, Harry. Come here. No. What's the matter? Are you crazy or something? Maybe. I just know I hate my life. There's a better kind. I know it. If you read some of these books, you know it, too. I suppose you figure you've been better off with that lousy saxophone player. At least he was honest. He was a dime a dozen chump. He worked for a living, that's one thing. I work. I've been working since I was 12 years old. Nobody ever give me nothing. If a man goes and robs a house, that's work too. I never robbed a house. What do you think you're talking about? You can hardly understand anything, can you? All right, get off that high horse, you dumb little pot. You menace. <laughs> I picked you up out of the gutter, I can throw you back there, too. You never had a decent meal before you met me. Yeah, but I had to have them with you. You eat terrible, you got no manners. <laughs> picking your shoes off all the time, that's another thing. You're picking your teeth. You're just not cool. <laughs> I'm as cool as you are. And that... Cheap perfume you put on your skin. Cheap? I don't know nothing cheap. Except you. You don't know me. Nobody can own anybody. There's a law of sense. Ah, uh, don't tell me about the law. If I was scared of the law, I wouldn't be where I am. Where are you? All right, all right, you talked enough. You don't like it here, beat it. Go on. You'll be back. Hey, where are you going? Would you do me a favor, Harry? What? Drop dead. <laughs> Judy, Judy Holiday, darling, how wonderful you are. And also thanks to Martin Blaine as Paul and Ralph Bell as Brock for a neat assist. Oh, Judy, come here, darling. I want to tell you something. 
I just want to say how great it is to have you on the program again, and all the other talented people who appear with us, to make this a divine hour and a half, that I can hardly wait until Sunday rolls around each week. He's so emotional about a radio program. <laughs> well, of course I'm emotional. I just adore doing this program, the excitement, the suspense, the wonderment of watching the show unfold from its very inception until it becomes a living, breathing thing. You'd be better off getting emotional about a living, breathing fella. <laughs> Darling, you don't seem to understand my point. I spend all my time here at the studio rehearsing, interviewing people, meeting the guests, checking the scripts. Well, I practically live right here at the studio. You keep a neat studio. <laughs> you should get married. Married? I am married to my art, to the fella, to my career. You should get a divorce and marry a fella. <laughs> I haven't time for marriage, darling. I have my radio work to think of. Radio is my life. On a cold night, you can't warm your feet on the back of a microphone. <laughs> I'd like to show you how warm one of my feet is right now, sister. <laughs> what are you mad about? All I said is you should get married. Maybe you're doing something wrong. I am doing nothing wrong. Maybe you should. <laughs> Look, in the first place, when you talk, your voice is too low. I have always spoken this way. Sure, that's why you're not married. <laughs> you should talk a little higher. When a fella calls you up and a man answers, it's you, so he hangs up. <laughs> My voice is recognized all over the world. I'm sure, you talk so loud they can hear you all over the world. <laughs> hey, where do you buy your clothes? That dress, for instance. I buy my clothes at Hattie Carnegie. I wouldn't mention it to a fella. <laughs> you scare him off? Fella knows you go to Hattie Carnegie, you pay as high as 25 bucks for a dress. Goodbye, Charlie. <laughs> My dear woman, this dress happens to cost 725 bucks. Now you're talking higher. And you ought to use makeup. I am using makeup. So don't. <laughs> and you should use perfume. A fellow likes to sniff around. <laughs> Uh, Judy, darling, I am not interested in these bloodhounds you seem to know so well. I know a dentist. Would you like a dentist? Or maybe a druggist? How'd you like to be a pharmacist, mate? This is preposterous, Judy. I have men throwing themselves at my feet all the time. I know a chiropodist. <laughs> How corny can you get? Oh. Judy, where do you meet this sordid assortment of men? It's easy. You go where men go. You shoot pool. Like a Bengal answer. Darling, I appreciate tremendously your trying to find a man for me. And I know you have a lot of little tricks up your sleeve that work very well for you. But as far as I'm concerned, I believe there's a man for every woman and a woman for every man. Now, nobody can improve on that. He so said, don't improve it. I just get in on it. <laughs> uh, Judy, uh, my dear, with all the restraint at my command and with the studied nonchalance acquired through years of training in the theater, I say to you calmly and dispassionately, that your brazen intrusion on my private life have brought me to the end of my tether. You have to go through all that just to say drop dead. <laughs> I'd rather change the subjects. Good evening, Tallulah. 
Oh, a welcome change of subjects. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a handsome and talented visitor from Hollywood, Mr. Robert Cummings. <laughs> oh, Bob, darling, it's so nice to... It's so nice to have you on our program. What are you doing in New York? Uh, well, Tallulah, I left Hollywood to come here to... Uh, yes, I know. Do you remember the last time I saw you, darling? It was in Hollywood, the party of Catherine Hepburn. Do you remember Bob? Well, as a matter of fact, Oh, what I... a party that was, darling. Isn't Katie the loveliest woman you've ever known? I simply adore her and the party that was one of the guests I've ever attended. Will you ever forget that wonderful food and that lovely orchestra and those fabulous people? Look how she's trying to get a fella. <laughs> Tallulah, let him talk. Oh, oh, what were you saying, Bob, darling? Me? Oh, nothing. I, uh, I was just telling you about that lovely party at Catherine Hepburn's in Hollywood. Only it wasn't Catherine Hepburn. It was Catherine Cornell, and it was in New York. Oh, no, darling. It was Catherine Hepburn. Oh, I'm sorry, Tallulah, but I'm sure it was Catherine Cornell. <laughs> it was Catherine Hepburn. I will stake my reputation on it. Well, that's a pretty small stake, but it was Catherine <laughs> Cornell. <laughs> oh, you infernal. Tallulah, don't be such a boss. Let him win. Oh, well, anyway, Bob, wherever it was, I remember you were the handsomest man there. No, oh, I wouldn't say that. No, but you were, darling, really. <laughs> I remember saying to everyone there, I said, Robert Cummings is the handsomest man at this party. Oh, I wouldn't say that. All right, darling, I won't. Now she lets him win. Uh, what did you say you were doing in New York, Bob? Yeah, well, I, I came here to see some shows. Um, have you seen Guys and Dolls, Tallulah? Uh, uh, no, I haven't, but I hear it's simply wonderful, but I haven't been able to get any tickets. Have you? Why, yes, I have two tickets. I'd, I'd love to take you, but the seats aren't together. Oh, that's all right, darling. We can meet after the show. Well, that'll be a little difficult. One ticket is for Monday and one's for Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> Tallulah, laugh at his jokes. No! <laughs> Better don't laugh. Excuse me, but who is this lovely young lady directing traffic here? <laughs> oh, I'm terribly sorry, Bob. I thought you knew Judy Holliday. Judy Holliday? Well, now, this is a thrill. Yeah, I, I saw Bourne yesterday at least a half dozen times. What a magnificent performance you gave him. What perfect casting. Uh, no one could possibly have played the part as well as you. Oh, I don't know. I've been approached by several producers to do Born Yesterday in summer theaters. No, oh, really? What billing? To Lula Bankhead in Born Yesteryear. <laughs> Dear boy. You're losing him. You better mention your money. <laughs> well, I, uh, I, I guess I'll just be running along. Oh, must you go, Bob? But I want to talk to you, no, darling. No, I'll, I'll see you later, darling. So long. I'll see you later. The kiss of death. <laughs> Tallulah, you're the slowest worker I ever saw Well, Judy, what could I have done? Lots of things You could have dropped your handkerchief You could have tried to look taller You could have fainted Well, Judy, I've been trying to tell you for half an hour That, I, that I'm not interested And besides, Robert Cummings happens to be a married man With a wife and family See how slow you are <laughs> I am not interested in your underhanded methods of getting men Why not? All is fair in love and war. Fair? What do you mean, fair? Why, that ball was fouled by a mile. Leo, come back here. Sunlight on the trumpets Here they come with the banners flying high In my throat there's a lumpy sort of feeling And a bright gleam of pride is in my eye Here they come with the clarinets a wailing Here they come rather bravely up the square And I know in a moment I'll be cheering And my fine Sunday hat will be high in the air Society of Students Conservatory Band Yes, the new Ashmolean You have been listening to Meredith Wilson and the Big Show Orchestra and Chorus. Now it's time for me to ring my chimes. Back in a moment, darlings. This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company. The 
Big Show. This is the National Broadcasting Company Sunday Extravaganza with the most scintillating personalities in show business. The Big Show, the Sunday night feature of NBC's All-Star Festival, is brought to you by Chesterfield, the cigarette that has for you mildness with no unpleasant aftertaste, the cigarette that brings you Bing Crosby and Bob Hope, by the makers of Anison for fast relief from the pain of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia, and by RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. The big stars in this program are Fred Allen, Robert Cummings, Lorraine Day, Jimmy Durante, Leo DeRocher, Portland Hoffa, Judy Holliday, Frankie Lane, Jane Pickens, Meredith Wilson and his big show orchestra and chorus, and every week, your hostess, the glamorous, unpredictable Tallulah Bankhead. <laughs> Well, darlings, it's amazing how the big show has caught on. Now, this week, there's a lovely article in Red Book and in Look magazine, a tremendous layout of photographs. And you should read some of the wonderful things they say. Well, I hope you won't think, darlings, that I'm being immodest or boasting, but I simply must quote one of the entrancing things they write about me. Well, here it is. Now, here's what it says. Tallulah is about as sweet and sentimental as a third rail. <laughs> well, now, that really captures the true me, which so few people understand. Sweet and sentimental. I wonder what a third rail is. A third rail, Tallulah, is like a third vice president of a radio network. It's dangerous to cross him. Well, Alan. <laughs> if he's alive. <laughs> It's nice to see you again, darling. Thank oh, you. Oh, didn't I just read your name in Reader's Digest? You were discovering uh, antihistamine or, or taking it or something. No, no. The only thing I've taken recently, Tallulah, is a new job. Oh, I'm so happy for you. I could exult. I'll wait. Are you back you're... in radio? Uh, no. Ad lib again, dear. I didn't hear it. No, no, I'm... <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not in radio, Tallulah. I am in the theater at Lowe's 342nd Street. <laughs> Well, I must come up and see you sometime, darling. I adore vaudeville. It's on the west side, I mean, if you're coming up in that character. <laughs> you, uh, you adore vo uh, vaudeville? Well, I'm not exactly in vaudeville. I used to be in vaudeville with a partner. My partner would shoot himself out of a cannon, and he used to drink a lot. Well, one night, he was loaded, and the cannon wasn't. <laughs> and uh, he went off with a bang, and the act split up, and uh, from then on, I was through with acting. But, darling, you just said that you were in the theater. Well, I'm a junior executive. What is a junior executive? Well, a junior executive in a movie theater is a man who wears a tuxedo in the daytime and has the key to the cigarette machine. <laughs> oh, Jalou, I wish you were there when I was hired. I was kneeling on the floor in the manager's office. The manager, a Mr. Robert Cummings, placed his hand on my shoulder after brushing aside the dandruff <laughs> and said, Alan, you are getting this job because you have talent, you have personality, you have savoir-faire, and you happen to be married to my sister. Yes, sir. This theater has the finest marquee, the finest lobby, the finest orchestra, the finest loges, the finest... Pictures? Please, Alan, no defeatist talk. Oh, I'm sorry, sir, I'm sorry. Repeat after me. Movies are better than ever. <laughs> Movies are better than ever. Again? Movies are better than ever. Again? Movies are... Be uh, say, how long shall I keep repeating it, sir? Until they are. <laughs> this is going to be a lifetime job, sir. Well, that all depends. Yes, sir. Alan... Every picture theater is fully staffed. Yes, sir. Today, I am creating a position never before known in a motion picture theater. For me? Yes, Alan. You will be our up-to man. Congratulations. Well, Tallulah, that's how I got the job. But, Fred, tell me, what is an up-to man? Well, I stand in the lobby, you see, and when people rush in late, I tell them what has happened in the picture up to the time they <laughs> come in. Well, I'd like to see how that service works sometimes. Well, it's really very simple. I just stand in the lobby wearing a yellow swallowtail coat and see a sucker spats, 
<laughs> and sooner or later, uh, sooner or later, I hear a voice say, Pardon me, has the picture started? Oh, you're Portland, aren't you? Yes, the feature has been on for 10 minutes. What picture is it? Sunset Boulevard, starring Gloria Swanson, William Holden, and Eric von Stroheim. Now, I'll tell you what you've missed up to now. As the picture starts, you see a body floating face down in a swimming pool. Oh, it said in Luella Parsons' column, that body got the Academy Award for being the best corpse for 1950. Yes, it was the best corpse. I heard that. I read that the actor who played the body floating in the pool is making personal appearances now. He comes out on the stage and lies down flat on his face so people will recognize him from the picture. <laughs> if they don't get it right away, he drips a little as he's lying. But what else happens in Sunset Boulevard? Well, they fish the body out of the pool and send for a specialist. You know what a specialist is. Oh, a specialist is a doctor who has trained all his patients to be sick only during office hours. That's true. That's a specialist. Say, I think you'd better go in, Portland, before your popcorn cools off. Well, I hope this picture's better than that Western picture you had last week. Well, I wasn't working here last week. I was picketing outside. I missed the picture. I'm inside this week working. Are you lucky? Really? As the picture starts, yeah. Robert Mitchum is a little boy whose parents are killed. Yeah. And he lives with Marjorie Maine and her two children, who later grow up to be Teresa Wright and introducing John Rodney. <laughs> introducing John Rodney? You mean this is his first picture? Yes. Well, war is declared against the Indians. Yeah. And Robert Mitchum goes to fight Sitting Bull and his standing army. <laughs> What happens to introducing John Rodney? Oh, introducing doesn't go. Oh, introducing doesn't go, huh? Well, does the picture have a happy ending? Oh, yes. Introducing gets killed. Well, that was a short introduction, wasn't it? <laughs> Robert Mitchum and Teresa Wright get married. Yeah. And Sitting Bull is in the hospital in an oxygen wigwam. Oh, an oxygen wigwam for sick Indians. Uh, you didn't like this picture, eh? I wouldn't even like it when they showed it on television. Well, it'll be another week or so. You and can... I like most Westerns. <laughs> yeah? Because I like to ride horseback. Oh, you ride horseback, do you? Oh, I always ride side saddle. Well, why side saddle? That way, I save a little place where I can sit down the next day. <laughs> well, Tallulah, you see, that's how it goes in the lobby. Oh, darling, it must be... Ghastly standing around in the lobby all day explaining about that dead body floating in the swimming pool. Uh, uh, face down, too. Well, I'm, in, I'm the up two man and I have a job to do. An up two man has other problems to do. You know, when the theater is crowded and the ushers are busy, sometimes I hear this. Hey, buddy, my name is DeRocher and this is my wife. How about two seats together? Well, I'm sorry, Mr. DeRocher. I have two seats, but they're not together. Um, all right, honey. If we're not going to sit together, split the Hershey bar and give me my half. You and your big, fat Hershey bar. You're impossible. Go ahead. Say it. Say you hate me. I won't say I hate you, but my admiration for you is under control. Now, folks, folks, please, no fighting in the lobby, Who's please. Who's fighting? Well, you two are twitting each other, and twitting invariably leads to fisticuffs. Uh, there is an old saying... Five lady fingers do not make a fist. Go ahead, Leo. Shake the battery out of his flashlight. Now, just a minute. With that touch... <laughs> with that tuxedo, you'll have to go in the balcony. <laughs> Mr. DeRocher, don't you dare strike... Strike! I am Mita. That was right over the plate. Well, that gives you an idea, Tallulah. Oh, Fred, those troublesome types must fray your nerves, darling. Well, what can I do? I'm employed. I just have to stand there and take it. But it's dark in those theaters. Can't you step on their feet or back them into the drinking fountain to dampen their ardor or something? Oh, it's aggravating. Yesterday I was standing there and I heard someone say... Cadet! <laughs> Could you help me right away, please? It's urgent. My name is Judy Holliday. Well, what, what's wrong, uh, Miss Holliday? Well, I lost my son. He's a boy. 
what does your little boy look like? Oh, well, he's six years old and he's stuck in a lollipop. <laughs> well, how could you lose a boy six years old? It's possible I did it. <laughs> I see. He was sitting in the next seat. Yes. And when Sunset Boulevard started, I seen the body floating in the swimming pool. I fainted. I'm a very heavy fainter. Oh, you yes. <laughs> The one of the thud didn't bring you to when you heard the... N well, when you came to... Eric von Stroheim was on the screen. My little boy was gone. <laughs> also the lollipop. Well, I'll, I'll page the little boy. What's his name? I don't know. You don't know your own child's name? Well, he's crazy for movie stars. Every oh. week he takes the name of one of the stars in the picture he's seeing. Oh, very well, madam. I'll page him. Eric von Stroheim, your mother wants you. Paging Eric von Stroheim, your mother's looking for you. Eric von Stro... Well, I'm sorry, madam, he doesn't answer. Hey, that usher in the next aisle is pointing at you. Oh, I'll see what he wants. Uh, yes, Cuthbert? My poor little boy is lost. My doll, my angel. When I find him, I'll kill him. <laughs> madam, I think we have a clue. A little boy walked up to the usher in the next aisle and said, Got a message for Gloria Swanson? That's my little boy. Gloria! Gloria Swanson! <laughs> well... Kalula, as an up-to man, that's what I've been going through. Oh, Fred, you'd better give up your job in that movie theater. With all those mad people around, you won't be safe. Safe? He was out of my... What do you mean, safe? Leo, please! <laughs> And now, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to two favorites of ours, Bob Hope and Bing Crosby. Say, Bing, you got a minute? Oh, sure, Bob. I got all the time in the world. Don't tell me you own that, too. Oh, never mind that stuff. Get to work, will you? Okay. Folks, Better Tasting Chesterfield is the only cigarette that combines for you mildness with no unpleasant aftertaste. And you can prove that yourself. Just make our mildness test. Buy Chesterfields, then open them and enjoy that milder, mellow aroma. Now light one up. And you'll know Chesterfield's milder because it smokes milder. And Chesterfield leaves no unpleasant aftertaste. That fact has been confirmed by the country's first and only cigarette taste panel. Yes, mildness and no unpleasant aftertaste are what you and I and every smoker wants. Hurry up, Dad. Here comes the music. Chesterfield, Chesterfield always takes first place. That milder, mild tobacco never leaves an aftertaste. So open a pack, give them a smell, then you'll smoke them. And now, darlings, a return engagement on the big show of a love of a man with a divine voice. Frankie Lane singing the title song from his latest Columbia picture, Sunny Side of the Street. <laughs> You are on the doorstep. Just direct your feet over to the sunny side of the street. Can't you hear it up back? All oh, happy tune is your step. Life can be so sweet on the sunny side of the street. Now I used to walk around in the shade with all those blues on parade. But now I'm not afraid Cause I'm a rover who has crossed over And if I never have a cent Gonna be rich as the fella Go lust at my feet On the sunny side of the street So grab your coat Get your hat and leave your worries on the doorstep Just direct your feet over to can't you hear Pit a battle Happy tune is your step Life can be so sweet On the sunny side of the street Now I used to walk Round in the shade With all those blues on parade But now I'm not afraid Cause I'm a rover Who has crossed over And if I On the sunny side, on the sunny side of the street.
Thanks, Frankie, darling. That just happens to be one of my very favorites. Now, don't run along, sweetie. I want to ask you something about some records I made a few weeks ago. Oh, by the way, I hear you make records, too. Oh, uh, I've made a couple or three, Tallulah. Uh, my records are selling very well. Yeah? How many records have you sold? Well, counting the one I hope to sell you tonight, darling, 59. <laughs> 59? Is that all you sold? Well, my record's only been out 12 weeks. <laughs> they sent me a copy of the popularity poll of last week's recordings, and mine is already 412. <laughs> but it's only one behind Ajax, the foaming cleanser. <laughs> <laughs> well... It's really getting up there by creeps and bounds, isn't it? Oh, yes, because not only are people enjoying playing the record, but it also makes a charming cocktail tray. <laughs> That's a very novel idea. What is the recording, Tallulah? Uh, well, on one side, it's I'll be seeing you, and on the other side, it's you go to my head. <laughs> that must be the side you serve the cocktails on. <laughs> With the drinks I serve, darling, I'll be seeing you as the better side. <laughs> In which case, I would probably be seeing two of you. <sighs> you know, I never thought of doing that with our records. Um, is yours the unbreakable record or the breakable kind? Well, for some strange, peculiar reason, everybody insists on mine being the breakable kind. <laughs> uh, what kind are your records, Frankie? Well, we sell all kinds, you know. Uh -oh. How many have you sold? Well, when we made Mule Train, it sold over a million. Over a million? That's right. Oh, well, you must be selling them to strangers. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course we're going to sell records to strangers. If you suffer from pains of headaches, neuritis, or neuralgia... You should discover what many thousands have known for years, that Anison brings incredibly fast, effective relief. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, Anison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Probably at some time you have received an envelope containing Anison tablets from your physician or dentist. Thousands of people have been introduced to Anison this way. Try Anison yourself. The next time you suffer from the pains of a headache, neuritis, or neuralgia, you'll be delighted at how quickly relief can come. Anison is spelled A-N-A-C-I-N. Your druggist has Anison in handy boxes of 12 and 30 tablets and economical family-sized bottles of 50 and 100 for your medicine cabinet. Ask for Anison today. <laughs> And here now, ladies and gentlemen, one of the great, greatest singing actresses of the American theater, a young lady who is as heavenly to look upon as she is to listen to, the talented Miss Jane Pickens. <laughs> Jane has brought to us a wonderful novelty. She is first going to sing, I Can't Give You Anything But Love, as it was originally written, and then sing it as it might have been written by the operatic composer Richard Wagner, Miss Jane Pickens. I can't give you anything but love. Baby, that's the only thing I've plenty of. Baby, dream a while, scheme a while, you're sure to find happiness. And I guess. I'd like to see you looking so well, baby. Diamond cufflinks were worth a 
doesn't say they do till that lucky day you know dawn well baby I can give you And now, as it might have been written by Wagner. Thank you, Jane Pickens. <laughs> that was pretty good. <laughs> and now let's get on to our next portion uh, just, of... Uh, ju just a minute, Tallulah, just a minute. Yes, Fred. Now, I happen to hear that, your reaction to Jane's song, that was pretty good, Jane Pickens, and that quick brush off. I think I know what fomented... Fomented the, uh, my oh, vibe... by your own pet hardness, Bob. <laughs> I didn't know there was a pet hard on the premises. <laughs> as long as you had one, I thought I might as well use it for a little while. <laughs> But I think I know what fomented this uh, attitude of simulated peak, I might say. Uh, Tallulah, do you remember a Broadway play called The Little Foxes in which you starred? I do. And you, Miss Pickens, do you remember they made a musical play of The Little Foxes and they called it Regina and you sang the Tallulah Bankhead role? I do. I now pronounce you Jake LaMotta and Sugar Ray Robinson. <laughs> girls, you know the NBC rules. I want to see a good dirty fight, no punches barred. <laughs> And may the most vitriolic participant emerge victorious. <laughs> now shake adjectives and come out scratching. I don't know what he's talking about, Jane. Neither do I, Tallulah. We've always been very friendly, haven't we, darling? Of course, my sweet. Well, as a matter of fact, I saw you dining at the store club just uh, two or three times last week, and I nodded you, but you didn't see me. Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> trying to start an argument between us just because I starred in a play that ran over a year on Broadway and you were in the musical version that ran a pitiful seven weeks. <laughs> we had a lot to overcome, dear. You were associated with the play so long, people were staying away because they thought you were doing the singing. <laughs> Darling, when I was a little child living down on my plantation... 
My family spent a fortune cultivating my voice. They should have planted taters, and they should have planted cotton. <laughs> Janie, didn't you once do a sis- singing sister act, honey? Yes, I used to sing with my sister, Patty, and... Patty, of course, and which one were you, darling? Maxine or Laverne? <laughs> You're thinking of the Andrews sisters, Tallulah. At a time like this, why not? <laughs> Tallulah, didn't I see you on television last night? Or is something wrong with my set? I wouldn't be seen in your set. <laughs> Touche, sugar. Sugar? Did you say sugar, sugar? Where are you from? Oh, honey, I'm from Georgia. Well, Sister Pickens, I'm from Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> I know, honey, child. And I was wondering how you'd let that Yankee Allen come between us two Southern Bells. Why, Allen, just nothing but an old carpetbagger. Of course he is. <laughs> I can see the bags under his eyes from him. <laughs> And, honey child, if you look closer, you can see the carpet still rolled up in them. Imagine trying to start an argument between us. Why, Tallulah, you know I wish you all the things you wish for me. How dare you! Here's a word from RCA Victor. The amazing thing about the exciting new world of television is the way that television sets have become handsome, important pieces of furniture as well as functional instruments. Here, as in every phase of television, RCA Victor is the master. Take the fabulous new RCA Victor console with million-proof television, America's favorite television picture. Even if these cabinets were absolutely empty they would be worthy of a prominent place in the finest of living rooms. When you shop for television, consider the distinction an RCA Victor console will provide. For lovely period styling, see the RCA Victor Fairfield. Have your dealer show you the RCA Victor Regency. For the sophisticated living room, there's RCA Victor Modern. True modern, through and through. And RCA Victor offers you a breathtaking cabinet in the provincial. Yes, when you shop for television, be sure to consider the distinction of an RCA Victor console. Well, darling, in just a moment, we'll have our beloved Jimmy Durante with us. Also, Bob Cummings and I are going to do a scene from Private Lives... And Judy Holliday's coming back, but first, Ed Hurley would like to say... That this portion of the program was brought to you by Chesterfield, the cigarette that has for you mildness with no unpleasant aftertaste, the best cigarette for you to smoke. By the makers of Anison, for fast relief from pain of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia, and by RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. Now, Tallulah, if you'll ring your chimes... I'd love to, Ed. This, darling, is NBC, the national broadcasting company. This is the big show, and Tallulah is about to have a tete-a-tete with a handsome, dapper, debonair young man about town. I resemble that remark. Jimmy (laughs) Durante! Jimmy, my pet, how do you do it? How do you manage to do so many things and still look so healthy? Well, Tlud, I'll tell you, I've been reading a book. Look younger, live longer. You mean you've actually been eating wheat germs, blackstrap molasses, and yogurt? Yep, that's all I've been eating. It don't make you live longer, it just seems longer. (laughs) Well, that's very helpful food, Jimmy. It sticks to your ribs. Yeah, but on the outside. <laughs> and very becoming, Jimmy. Now, how did you get started on this health diet? Did, uh, did a doctor tell you to watch what you eat? In them cafeterias where I go, you gotta watch what you eat or somebody else will be eating it. <laughs> well, now, Jimmy, tell me some more about that uh, Look Younger, Live Longer uh, book. Uh, does it really work? Does it work? A friend of mine ate that stuff for three weeks... 
And when he died, he looked like a kid. <laughs> well, that, well, that diet has certainly done wonders for you, my darling. Oh, it ain't only the diet, Chilu. I also take deep breathing. I inhale a long, deep breath through my nose, using only one nostril, of course. <laughs> Other people gotta breathe, too. <laughs> then I go to my doctor and he gives me a shot of vitamin. A vitamin B1? I'm way past B1. I'm smart. Last year, I was up to B12. Then I graduated to B24. That made me feel twice as good. And when he gave me a B29... Boy, I was really flying. <laughs> oh, I got more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and just before dinner, I takes a short stroll through Central Park as a pick-me-up. <laughs> and wherever I go, it seems like there's always a girl to pick me up. Oh, well, naturally, darling. Naturally, for suit. <laughs> now, somewhere there's a fly in everyone's ointment, but mine seems much more serious than the rest. My romantic life with girls has been a disappointment, and folks, I've got to get it off my chest. I know some guys make an impression giving girls a limousine But with me it's not so easy Let me tell you what I mean My girlfriend don't want my money All they're after is me I'm as sad as can be a slight little nod, a look at my curls Will get me more girls than diamonds and pearls Honest folks, it isn't funny I'm embarrassed, you see I'd pay my own share, but gee Wherever I go, I don't spend a dime They don't want my dough, they want my time Why, there's havoc There's bedlam every time I roll my eyes why was I born with so much more than other guys? Guess I'll have to grin and bear it. I don't want sympathy. Now a fellow can make a buck as long as he may live. But a guy like me, there's just so many kisses I can give. Won't you take my money and leave poor little me be? Ah, folks, I really got a problem, and it's getting pretty serious. How can one man have so much and conceal it so well? <laughs> Why, only the other day, Rita Hayward offered me $1,000 for a lock of my hair. Betty Grable offered me $3,000 for a lock of my hair. Greg Garson offered me $5,000 for a lock of my hair. What a dilemma. Just when I can make a fortune, I run out of merchandise. <laughs> Girls, won't you take my money? And leave poor little me be, yes, sir. And leave poor little me be. Jimmy, Jimmy, darling, we'll all live longer and look younger as long as we have you and your songs around. <laughs> and now, darlings, I can throw away my script because we are going to do for you now an excerpt from a Noel Coward play I had the pleasure of doing a few years ago. I refer, of course, to Private Lives. The only part of my private life I don't mind making public. 
And here to appear in it with me is Robert Cummings. <laughs> Private Lives is the story of two newlywed couples honeymooning in France. A capricious fate has guided them to adjoining suites in the same hotel. On one terrace overlooking the sea, nostalgic with memories induced by a certain song, sits one bride, Amanda Prenn. On the adjoining terrace, equally affected by the song, sits one bridegroom, Elliot Chase. Perhaps the song reminds them that not so very long ago, they were married to each other. Say you love me too Someday I'll find you again You? Oh, no, it couldn't be. <laughs> Thoughtful of them to have played that, wasn't it? What are you doing here? I'm on my honeymoon. How interesting, so am I. I hope you're enjoying it. It hasn't started yet. Neither is mine. Oh, no. I can't help but feel that this is a little unfortunate. Are you happy? Perfectly. Good. That's all right, then, isn't it? Are you? Ecstatically. I'm delighted to hear it. Well? Oh, for goodness sake, give me a cigarette. Oh, of course. Oh, what are we to do? I don't know. I wonder whose yacht that is. Mm, the Duke of Westminster, I expect. It always is. I wish I were on it. I wish you were, too. <laughs> There's no need to be nasty. Yes, there is every need. I've never in my life felt a greater urge to be nasty. And you've had some urges in your time, haven't you? <laughs> if you start bickering with me, Amanda, I swear I'll throw you over the edge. <laughs> oh, try it, that's all. Just try You upset it. everything, as usual. I've upset everything. What about you? Ever since the first moment I was unlucky enough to set eyes on you, my, my life has been insupportable. Oh, do shut up. There's no sense in going on like that. Nothing's any use. There's no escape ever. Don't be melodramatic. Do you want a cocktail? There are two here. There are two here, too. Well, let's have my two first. Shall we get roaring, screaming drunk? Oh, I don't think that would help. We did it once before. It was a dismal failure. It was lovely in the beginning. You have an immoral memory, Amanda. Here's to you. I tried to get away. The moment after I'd seen you, but he wouldn't budge. What's his name? Victor, Victor Prynne. Hmm. To uh, Mr. and Mrs. Victor Prynne. Uh, mine wouldn't budge either. What's her name? Sybil. To Mr. and Mrs. Elliot Chase. Heaven pity the poor girl. What's she like? Oh, uh, fair, very pretty. Oh, plays the piano beautifully. <laughs> Very comforting. How's yours? I'd rather not discuss it. <laughs> well, it doesn't really matter. He'll probably come popping out here in a minute, and I shall see for myself. Uh, does he uh, know I'm here? Oh, yes, I told him. Well, that's going to make things a whole lot easier. Oh, you needn't be frightened. He won't hurt you. If he comes near me, I'll scream the place down. <laughs> does Sybil know I'm here? Oh, no, no. I pretended I had a presentiment. I tried terribly hard to persuade her to leave for Paris. <laughs> I tried, too. <laughs> it's lucky we didn't both succeed, isn't it? <laughs> Otherwise, we should probably all have joined up in uh, Rouen or somewhere. <laughs> yes, in some frowsy little hotel. <laughs> oh, that would have been much, much worse. <laughs> yes, I can see us all now sailing down in the morning for an early start. Oh, lovely, lovely. <laughs> 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 Oh, dear. <laughs> What's happened to yours? Oh, didn't you hear her screaming? She's downstairs in the dining room, I think. Mine's being grand in the bar. Oh, it's really awfully difficult. Have, have you known her long? Oh, about four months. We, we met at a house party in Norfolk. Very flat Norfolk. How old is dear Victor? 
34, 35, and Sybil? Well, I blush to tell you, only 23. Oh, you've got a mucker, all right. Uh. I shall reserve my opinion of your choice until I have met dear Victor. I wish you wouldn't keep on calling him dear Victor. It's extremely irritating. Well, that's how I see him. Dumpy and fair and very considerate with glasses. Dear Victor. As I said before, I would rather not discuss him. At least I have good taste enough to refrain from making cheap jibes at Sybil. You said Norfolk was flat. That was no reflection on her. <laughs> Unless she made it flatter. Your voice takes on an acid quality whenever you mention her name. Oh, I shall never mention it again. Good. And I'll keep off Victor. Thank you. <sighs> Nasty, insistent little tune. <laughs> Extraordinary how potent cheap music is. What exactly are you remembering at the moment? The Palace Hero skating rink in the morning. Bright, strong sunlight. Everybody whirling around in vivid colors. And you kneeling down to put on my skates for me. <laughs> You'd fallen on your fanny a few moments before. <laughs> it was beastly of you to have laughed like that. I, I felt so humiliated. Oh, poor darling. You remember waking up in the morning, standing on the balcony... Looking out across the valley. Yes. Blue shadows on white snow. Cleanness beyond belief. High above everything in the world. How beautiful it was. It's nice to think we had a few marvelous moments. A few? Oh, we, we had heaps, really. Only they slipped away to the background when one only thinks of the bad ones. What fools we were to ruin it all. What utter, utter fools. Do you feel that way, too? Of course. Oh, why did we? The whole business was too much for us. We were so ridiculously over in love. Funny, wasn't it? It's horribly funny. Selfishness, cruelty, hatred, possessiveness, petty jealousies. All those qualities came out in us just because we loved each other. Well, perhaps they were there anyhow. No, no. It's love that does it. The devil with love. The devil with love. And yet here we are, starting afresh with two quite different people. In love all over again, aren't we? Aren't we? No. And... We're not in love all over again, and you know it. Good night, Amanda. But, Mr. Lady, come I, I must go and find Sybil. I, I, I must go and find Victor. Well, why don't you? I don't want to. Oh, it's shameful, shameful of us. But I... I've never loved anyone else. Not even for an no, instant. No, no, you mustn't, Elliot. Stop, you mustn't. No, no, you love me too, don't you? There's no doubt about it anywhere, is there? No, no doubt anywhere. Oh, you're looking very lovely tonight, you know. This moonlight. Your skin is clear and cool and your eyes are shining. You're growing lovelier and lovelier every second I look at you. You don't hold any mystery for me, darling. Do you mind? There isn't any of you that I don't know, remember, and want. I'm glad, my sweet... More than any desire anywhere, deep down in my deepest heart, I... I want you back again. Please. Don't say no more. You, you're making me cry so dreadfully. Oh, darling, what now? I don't know. What now? No, I'm, I'm utterly lost. Uh, we must think quickly, oh, quickly. Yeah, well, escape. Together? Yes, yes, of course. Now, now. Oh, no, no, it would break with his heart. Well, and Sybil's too, probably, but they're bound to suffer anyhow. Think of the torture we'd lead them to if we stayed. Infinitely worse than any cruelty in the world, pretending to love them and loving each other so desperately. Oh, this is sheer raving madness. Something's happened to us. We're not sane. Where shall we go? Yeah, Paris first. My, 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 my car's in the garage already. Oh, we're being so bad. So terribly bad. We shall suffer from this. I know we shall. Well, it can't be helped. Starting all those awful rows all over again. No, no. We're older and right. Well, now. what difference does that make, darling? The moment either one of us gets a bit nervy, off we'll go again. Well, stop shilly-shallying, Amanda. Well, I'm trying to be sensible. But you're only succeeding in being completely idiotic. Idiotic, indeed. What about you? Now, look here, Amanda. Oh, no, no. <laughs> darling, darling, I... 
I didn't. I won't move from here unless we have a compact. A sacred, sacred compact never to quarrel again. Easy to make, but very difficult no, to No, no, no. It's the bickering that always starts in that, darling. Look, the moment we notice we're bickering, either one of us, we must promise on our word of honor to stop dead. Oh, I know. I know. We'll invent some uh, a phrase or a catch word, which when either one of us says it, automatically cuts off all conversation for at least uh, uh, five minutes. Uh, two minutes, dear, with an option for renewal. <laughs> All right, darling, what should it be? Let's see, what should it be? Um, I've got it. Solomon Isaac. That'll do. Well, come on, come on. Uh, what does we do if we meet out on the way downstairs? Well, we'll run like stags. What about clothes? Well, I've got a couple of bags I haven't unpacked yet. I've got a small trunk. Well, send the porter up for it. Oh, this is terrible. Oh, come sir. on, come on, come on. Don't waste time. Uh, well, or, or, oughtn't we to leave notes or something? No, no, no. We'll telegraph from somewhere on the road. Oh, no, darling, I daren't. No, I daren't. It's too wicked of us, baby. I simply daren't. Kiss me. Oh. There. Now would you behave? Yes, but I did, darling. Solomon Isaacs. Now, now let's run. Thank you, Robert Cummings. You were really divine, darling. And as for you, Tallulah, darling, I'll talk to you when I get home. I knew I'd wind up one day on this program talking to myself. Oh, Tallulah. Yes, Jimmy? I just had a beastly idea. How would you like to see me play that scene from Private Lives? How beastly can you get? Pretty beastly. Because Judy Holliday is going to play it with me. Well, Judy and the Beast. <laughs> Go ahead, darling. <laughs> this is the story of a boy and girl who are married, but not to each other. They're sitting on two fire escapes. The boy and the girl look at each other. They recognize each other. And in a voice choked with emotion, the girl says, Yoo-hoo! <laughs> Amanda! Idiot! <laughs> what are you doing here? I'm on my honeymoon. What are you doing here? I'm on my honeymoon. How horribly. Are you, uh, happy? What do you mean, uh... Eh? Ecstatically. Uh, where's your husband? He's in the room sleeping. So, what are you doing on the fire escape? The room is on fire. <laughs> How chic. <laughs> Cigarette? Match? No, thanks. I'll get a light off my husband. <laughs> oh, what beautiful music. Use Ajax, the foaming cleanser. <laughs> Amanda. You always did have a lovely voice, and you kept a clean sink, too. <laughs> How sheer whimsy. Would you like a cocktail? Shrimp or tomato juice? Hey, where's your wife? She's inside unpacking her wedding tosso. I blush to tell you, she's young, only six. <laughs> she plays the piano. Big deal. <laughs> What's her name? Syllable. <laughs> Mine's name is 
is Victor. He plays too. What instrument? The phonograph. Ah, RCA Victor. That's my boy. How utterly. I feel a nostalgic coming on. You still bothered with that? It's the night air. Come on inside and lay down. I was thinking of the time before I was married to Syllable. And you were married to Victor. That was before you were married to Reggie. And I had just left Millicent to elope with Sophie while you were leaving Reggie to marry Winston in that little church on the hill. That was the day before Evelyn divorced Evelyn. Remember? How come you left out Max? Amanda! Yes, idiot. <laughs> Let's you and me escape down this fire escape together. I'll go first and you meet me over at Lowe's Pitkin Theater. What's playing there? King Solomon Isaac's Mines. <laughs> That'll be our password. King Solomon Isaac's Mines? I can't go with you. It's all off. I already seen the picture. <laughs> Amanda, you've been an ugly brick through this whole mess. <laughs> Darlings, that was a delight. Idiot's delight. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, we have a treat for you. Meredith Wilson has written a new song. And when Meredith Wilson writes a new song, that's news. Because this is the same Meredith who wrote our closing theme for the big show, May the Good Lord Bless and Keep You. Now, for the first time anywhere, Meredith Wilson with the Big Show Auction Chorus in It's Easter Time. It's an inspiring song that, strangely enough, begins with the story of a little man who came down from Mars. <laughs> A pleasant little fellow came from Mars to pay a visit. And he remained the whole long winter through. Each Sunday he'd proceed to a different church and creed. And he always found himself an empty pew or two. In fact, he often noticed quite a few. Yet far from being tiring, all his Sundays were inspiring. Then one sunny day, all innocent indeed, he tried to pay his normal Sunday visit. But the church was jammed with people from the cellar to the steeple. And the poor, bewildered man cried out, What is it? It's Easter time. The bells on the hill are ringing, ringing once again. There's a smile on the face of this age-old world that seems to say Amen. It's Easter time, the bonnets are gaily nodding, nodding to and fro, while the folks walk to church as they did so long. On the dining room table with fancy Easter eggs for all. And there's a lily in all its glory standing in the hall. It's Easter time, the dawn of the year is shining in the hearts of men. With 
the joys and the hopes that have risen once I find myself at a loss for words. Come here. Maybe this kiss will tell you how I feel. Oh. Oh. Well, Meredith, how was that? Well, sir, Miss Bankhead. <laughs> well, sir, after a kiss like that, I'll take that up with you later, darling. But this just about completes our show for this week. And now we're all off on a plane for Hollywood from which point we will bring you our next Sunday. And our next guests will be next Sunday. They will include the Andrew sisters, Joan Davis, Judy Garland, Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis, Groucho Marx, Gordon McRae and others, and of course, our very own Meredith Wilson and the big show orchestra and chorus. Until then, darlings, may the good Lord bless and keep you, whether near or far away. Judy. May you find that long-awaited golden day today. Leo? May your troubles all be small ones and your fortune ten times ten. Fred? May the good Lord bless and keep you till we meet again. Portland? May you walk with sunlight shining And a bluebird in every tree Jane May there be a silver lining Back of every cloud you see Bob Fill your dreams with sweet tomorrows Never mind what might have been Jimmy May the good Lord bless and keep you Till we meet again, Frankie May you long recall each rainbow Then you'll soon forget the rain May the warm and tender memories Be the ones that will remain Good night, darlings. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.